Thank you so much. I'm the Mac guy, so I'm just going to check that this works here. Great. So I only have a few minutes. So during this talk or shortly afterwards, I'll tweet out a few of the links so you guys can reference the articles that I speak about specifically. I'm like Sherry. I love disruptors in business. I get really excited about the Davids taking on the Goliaths, about the small startups that take the incumbents and take the things that they think are probably their greatest strengths and turn them into their Achilles heels. And I find myself thinking all the time and wondering where the next wave will come from, where the future ones will come from. And at IDEO, we help companies grow through innovation. And we actually have frameworks for thinking about what makes good innovation that I think can also be applied to the topic of disruptors of the future. So one of the frameworks we use is exactly this. And one of the things we've learned is, and I think actually Brian did a good job of already addressing this, to make great innovation, you have to make sure it lies at the intersect of what's desirable. We look at that first, because if you're not meeting a real human need, then you're not actually solving a real problem and you're not creating any value. So we start by saying, is it desirable? We then ask ourselves, can it really be made? Is it feasible? And finally, is it viable? By viability, we mean, can it actually be scaled? Now, if you go to patent offices globally, I would imagine there's patents written that at the time people thought were phenomenal examples of potential innovations, and actually they're gathering dust. And the reason they're gathering dust probably is because they don't lie at the intersect here. So when thinking through, you know, disruptors of the future, an incredibly daunting topic, I wondered if we can actually hijack this framework, because I think that the disruptors that are successful, you know, maybe Manga High, maybe the Khan Academy, they will lie at the intersect here too. In thinking about actually the trends in each of those spaces, I think William Gibson, who's a very sort of daunting figure on this image here, but he was a phenomenal novelist, and I think he had some great intuitions about where the future was going to come from. And one of the smartest things I think he said is that actually the future's already here, it's just unevenly spread. We've seen some coming technologies already today, but what I'd love to do through the rest of this talk is actually take you through the trends or the shifts in thinking around how human needs are changing, and I think they're changing radically. We take it for granted sometimes. How what we can actually make is shifting, and finally, how the businesses are structured to actually meet those changes, meet those shifts are changing as well. So let's kick off with how human needs are shifting. Now, it's a bit of a leap back in history, but this gentleman invented probably the most popular and famous triangular framework in human history. It's Abraham Maslow, so the founder of humanistic psychology. And that framework he developed, I think, still stands absolutely true today. He realised that once we've you know, met our physiological and safety needs, and there's some examples of the moment of people through natural disasters, etc., where this is becoming a pressing issue again. But most of us, the fact that we're sat in this room today, I think we can safely draw the conclusion that we're marching up the pyramid successfully. So we're now thinking about love, belonging, esteem, and eventually self-actualization. And I think what's interesting is actually the way that we're meeting these is shifting hugely. Now, 50 years ago, the American dream was well known. We were chasing 2.4 cars, 2.4 kids. We've heard that that might not be viable anymore. But the recession, the change in the global circumstances, global warming, etc., it's forced some constraints on us. Paul Sappho, the futurist, gives a lovely example of this. He says, you know that materialism's kind of reached its peak when if you look around us in London, we see storage companies everywhere. Those storage companies are a sign that we've got enough. <laughs> we've probably got too much. And actually, we no longer need material means. We'll no longer need a sense of ownership to meet this stuff. And we've changed our philosophy. So let's look at some ways that we've changed how we're meeting Maslow's needs. So first and foremost, I think we're finding new ways to signal belonging. And this is really important. I think we heard of professional networks potentially as a way of doing this. But historically, you know, I would have probably just used my dad as a role model. And if he watches this, I still do. Don't worry, we're still cool. 
But if, I think historically I would have done that. We were often constrained by the Dunbar number, which was basically 120 people that we could have in our social network. And that was it. The groups would come from that. But now we have access to an unbelievable range of different groups. And that access gives us a new opportunity to signal belonging. I'm so inspired by the fact that 20 million people liked Obama's Facebook page. That's something like 3% of 600 million users of Facebook. Those people are showing belonging to a new club. It's a new human need, and we're starting to see it reflected in new ways. I also think there's radical shifts in how we're finding self-actualization, so creativity and that stuff, and it's shifting wildly, and I'm excited to watch this continue. And in probably the most flawed experiment ever conducted, I wondered how could we actually show that people are moving away from just material consumption and starting to want to improve themselves, learn. And so I used Google Trends, and I just did a plot of sales, which is obviously a, historically a very important reason to use the internet. And you can see that's this flat line here, the blue line. And then I did a plot of how to, which is a search thread of someone that probably wants to improve themselves. You know, it's flawed, please don't shoot me down for it. But you can see since 2007, it's effectively doubled. And this trend is pretty linear. I would expect it to continue. And the fact that we can access and achieve more things will create this snowball effect. So I was inspired last month by the story, actually, of a 10-year-old Canadian girl who found a supernova. <coughs> now, the people are finding new ways to demonstrate their own value. I should caveat it by, I'll send out the tweet with the link. Her dad was an astronomer, so you do sort of suspect <laughs> something went on. But you can tell, you can tell that people are being able to access and do new things that would never have been possible before. Or a colleague, Neil Stevenson, loves referencing a lady called Lauren Luke, who some of you might know. She's a single mum up north, 27-year-old, no formal training in makeup. She started posting her videos, similar to Khan Academy's sort of origin. She posted how-to videos on the internet, on YouTube. To date, she's had 80 million plus views. She was one of the highest watched channels in the UK. She's partnered to create her own makeup line. So this stuff can create impact. And I thought it was lovely just the other day, which you can't see, this vague tiara image here. She actually did a video of how to emulate the wedding makeup from the royal wedding last week. <laughs> I'm assuming it was Kate's, not Williams, but <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me how quickly you can access this stuff. She had 20,000 views when we looked a couple of days ago. So people are finding ways to demonstrate their value. They're actually moving from consumption to participation, learning, co-creation. So let's think about also how, what the big shifts are in what's actually feasible. And we've already seen examples today of phenomenal changes here. We understand Moore's law. You guys see that all around you. This is a way I like to visualize it. This, I think, retro cool box here is the Macintosh, launched in 1984, eight megahertz processing. As a visualization of Moore's law, if you wanted to actually emulate the processing power of your iPhones, I can see a few out at the moment. I hope you're tweeting nice things if that's what you're doing. You can see, if you wanted to emulate that, you'd have to line up 78. Macintoshes to emulate the iPhone. They were $2,500 in 1984. That's kind of quarter of a million bucks in 1984 currency to emulate the processing in your iPhone. And this will continue. Actually, I think Eric Schmidt, former now CEO of Google, did a great day of just describing this with this quote, which you can read yourselves. But the interesting thing is data is basically becoming a commodity. It's like a raw material, and the value is created in processing it into information. And I get excited about startups doing that. And some of the most disruptive forces in technology find creative ways to do it. There's a wonderful example, actually. A guy called Pete Warden, a developer, you may have seen this, just two weeks ago, released some software. If you guys have iOS 4 on your iPhones or your iPad 3G, I guess, then you're basically being, your location's being recorded. And you can plot that geographically on a map, which is exactly what I did here. So this is for my second phone, which you can tell. I, if I was important to Apple, I imagine that this would be the title of a presentation, or the presentation title would be, how can we get Tom to use his phone other than when he's on the way to the airport and back? 
<laughs> you can see exactly what I was doing there. But you can see it's valuable in the right hands, this information. It's the curation, the processing that's important. And what's true of bits is also true of atoms. We're actually converging in a place where we'll all be able to make everything. This is a wonderful example, actually. It's the MakerBots for 1,300 bucks. You can build this kit, you assemble yourself, and in this case, they printed a beautiful blue bunny rabbit. You could do that with three ears if that was your dream. You could do that at home. And it's not just you know, superficial joke items like bunny rabbits that this matters to. It's also happening potentially in human organs. So Anthony Atala did a wonderful, wonderful TED talk where he actually, during the talk, printed, so it's an idea of additive manufacturing rather than subtractive, which is far, far more sustainable by definition. He printed a kidney live on stage. Now you could say there's some that would argue that as a result of technologies like this, the first thousand year old human is already on the planet. And it makes me think back to our first bit around, you know, we've got this desire for self-actualization. If you guys are living to a thousand years, you're going to have some serious self-actualizing to do. <laughs> you're going to need to be creative to occupy your time. And so in terms of feasibility, I think actually, you know, we're going to live for longer. We're going to be able to make almost anything. Bits and atoms will be commoditized. And we're actually going to have this innate drive to do it. So the final part of my talk, I'd love to actually share some thoughts on the viability around this. So who's actually going to capitalize on these forces? In this world of massive flux, massive change, where actually the citizen, the consumer is king, how are people going to adapt to that new system? And actually, when you see disruptors through the course of today, how are they actually living in this changing world? So the first thing that we'll absolutely see, and I think we've seen some wonderful examples, is they'll all be designed as systems. If you meet someone that tells you they're going to differentiate just around the look and feel of this pointer, you know their history. That is fully commoditized 24 hours after they produced it, before the tooling's even made. So we're going to have to design systems. So working with Hat Forward, a seed stage fund, we developed a framework that actually enables us to think through the whole of a business model. Business plans are dead. Don't waste your time writing biz business plans. They're redundant. Because actually, the interesting bit isn't the different chapters. It's the way that the chapters work together. It's the interdependencies. So design the interdependencies. An example referencing this additive manufacturing is a UK-based business called Digital Forming, who are doing a wonderful job, I think, potentially kind of doing for rapid manufacturing or mass customization, what Apple's done for music. They allow you actually to upload designs or designers to upload designs, the consumer to custom customize them. They use their own intuitive software called Yokodo to do that. You can see it's a vertically integrated experience. It's a system, and that's where the value will come from. The next thing we'll see is they have to be designed for extreme flexibility. So, you know, 18th, 19th century, industrial revolution, everything was about efficiency. That's all we cared about. It was about, you know, the constraint was not making enough. So in that system, the value moves to efficiency. And, you know, the Model T Ford, the reason it was black was because it dried the fastest on the production line. People cared about manufacturing effectively. And they built hierarchies, command and control systems that actually did a good job of that. That was about efficiency. The problem with these systems is they don't adapt. And we've just heard lots of reasons why the environment is changing all the time. So we have to reappraise the structures that can work in this world. And perhaps we have a lot to learn from nature on this. Actually, Tim, our CEO, I think did a lovely job of describing this from a transition away from a Newtonian philosophy to a Darwinism philosophy, where we value networks, we value emergent models. We don't build hierarchies, we value learning, we value adaptation. And the advantage of these systems, these networks that we can create, is that nodes can fall away and rejoin, and the function can change in real time. Amazingly, and I think we'll hear later today an example of this, I think you even see this in political disruptions. 
So January 25th, Egypt, it may just go down in history as the first leaderless revolution. A lot was conducted over social networks. In fact, I read that a child was named Facebook after the January 25th revolution. That's how much people give credit to their platform itself in that situation. And if you just look at tweets, I don't think this is a lovely a guy called Kovas Baguta visualise the tweet. Blue is English, red is Egyptian. You see no one, not even Vial Gonim, who sits here, actually stands out particularly. There was no absolute centre. So the final part that I'd love to share is that actually we all need to design radically for participation as well. That's partly designing with the consumer's mindset. Design everything in your business model through the eyes of the consumer, but it's more than that. It's actually designed for participation so you get better as users, as consumers, as citizens use the business. Google did a great job of this, unconscious participation if you like. This is scary in itself. They aggregate threads and you can see these, if I type in why is my, these prompts show me the top five, which is scary in itself. But they're statistically, <laughs> they are statistically aggregating searches. That's unconscious. Twitter can predict the Dow Jones index with 87% accuracy. Again, that's unconscious contribution around human sentiment. I get most excited about systems that are designed for conscious participation because that makes the brand stronger, it makes the business, the organisation stronger as well. Wikipedia is an obvious example of that. Wikipedia is effectively a giant collaboration innovation network, if you think about it. It's exactly what it is. And actually the 13 million articles that they've had to date on Wikipedia show you the advantage. It edits in real time. No one can sit at the top and edit every one of those articles. It's effectively a network. And I hope that, you know, recently when we designed Open IDEO, which is our invitation for consumers to participate to solve challenges for social good, I hope that we built these mechanics in. I hope that actually we built a lot of what we've just talked about today in. We certainly have an agile approach where we push new features that are usually recommended by the community rather than us every four weeks. And we certainly keep the site in beta. I actually don't understand in this day and age how anyone can take a beta sign off anything. Everything's changing. If anyone tells you they're moving out of beta, I think sell shares. Because I don't understand how you can transition that mindset. So, conclusion. I think the disruptors of the future, the things they'll have in common, they'll certainly enable belonging, creativity, participation, learning. They'll create flexible systems that are more than just bits or atoms. Those are commodities, raw materials now. They'll improve with use and finally they'll stay in beta. Thank you very much. <laughs>